My name is Ned Kitpride. I am the marketing product manager for ETC Power Controls. And today I am talking with Steve Terry, our resident NEC and UL and emergency lighting guru about emergency lighting system design. Steve, how are you doing today? Good, thank you. Excellent. Um, when we talk about emergency lighting system design, what are the key concepts that come to mind first for you? Okay, well, I think to start out with, an emergency system is unlike any other lighting system that we deal with, whether it be standard architectural lighting or entertainment lighting, in that it is a life safety system. That means that this emergency lighting system is responsible for getting people out of a building in the event of an emergency. And that emergency could be any number of things, fire, uh, equipment failure, uh, loss of utility power. But the overriding concern is the safety of the people were involved in providing a safe egress path out of the building. So that, with that fact top of mind, that uh, changes our emphasis on the design of the system from other typical systems in architectural or entertainment lighting and uh, makes us realize that the commercial aspects of the system, the cost of the system, um, the particular features of a given piece of equipment, these need to uh, take second place to the effectiveness of the system in, in providing the life safety function. Okay, so when we're talking about life safety, then in Again, conceptually in terms of system design, what are some of the specific, uh, maybe more practical aspects of protecting life safety that go into thinking about emergency lighting? Well, uh, the, the, the first thing is that the emergency system has to provide the required light levels to get out of the building safety, safely. In other words, uh, the minimum foot candle levels specified by NFPA 101, the life safety code, to get people out of the building in a safe manner. The second thing is that the reliability of the system in terms of its ability to guarantee that the lighting comes on to those foot candle levels in the event of, a, of an emergency becomes an overriding design factor. And that means uh, under any set of conditions of utility power, emergency power, uh, when, when triggered by this emergency event, mm -hmm. we have to guarantee that our system design is gonna deliver 100% reliability in, in, get, in getting lights on. So we want a system that is reliable, that provides enough lighting to get people out of a building safely uh, in, in case of an emergency event. Um, when you talk about required light levels or other requirements, so, you know, I look at something like the NEC handbook and not only is it a little intimidating just in terms of sheer volume, but also in terms of where to, where to start. Can you break down for someone like me who's not got an extensive, you know, NEC study background and just help me break this down a little bit into something that I can understand and, and reckon with. Sure. Realize to start with that <clears throat> there is what I like to call a constellation of standards that read on requirements for emergency lighting. The NEC, NFPA 70, is just one of those standards. So we have to look a little bit outside the NEC for some of the core requirements. For instance, how much light is going to be required, what, what foot candle levels are going to be required, and how long must it operate for, and how quickly must it come up in the event of an emergency and be available. Those are going to be uh, covered in the NFPA 101, the Life Safety Code. Okay. Then, once we get to the NEC, pretty much all matters related to emergency lighting are contained in Article 700. Okay. And actually, the task of designing 
an effective and safe emergency lighting system is not quite as daunting as one might think because the codes are very prescriptive. They don't actually leave us a lot of choices. They tell us uh, how long we have to get the lights on in an emergency, how long they have to st the lights have to stay on, what kind of equipment, what types of equipment we can use mm -hmm. to turn them on, right? Now, where it becomes more complex is there are lots of choices in terms of the integration of the emergency function of the system into the rest of the lighting system. So how, that, how the system goes together in terms of integration and what the specific components are, that's where different choices come to bear and we have to make informed, rational decisions based on the type of system we have. Okay, so what are some of those specific choices? Okay, well the first thing is we have to ensure that uh, in terms of emergency lighting control, lights come on automatically. In other words, it isn't enough that emergency power becomes available so the lights can come on. When the normal power disappears or the emergency is declared by some signal, the lights must automatically come on. And that means removing or bypassing any normal control that the lights might be under. That means dimmers, switches, relays that normally control the lights need to be bypassed out of the way in the event of a power failure or other emergency so that the lights automatically come on. One tool that is specified in Article 700 for that is called the automatic load control relay. And that's basically a device that upon receipt of a command or upon sensing loss of normal power, which is the most common emergency requirement, right? The, the, the power company's power disappears, utility power is no longer available, emergency power switches on, and now we have to bypass whatever switches and dimmers controlled these emergency lighting fixtures. Uh, uh, the automatic load control relay, or ALCR for short, is, is a device that will allow us to do that. Okay, what other devices allow us to do that? Well, a, a new device that was introduced in the 2017 National Electrical Code is the Branch Circuit Emergency Lighting Transfer Switch, okay. or BCELTS. Now, that device is distinct from an ALCR, or Automatic Load Control Relay, because it physically transfers an emergency lighting load from a normal branch circuit to an emergency branch circuit, fed by an alternate power source. Sure. Uh, and at the same time bypasses the control of that emergency lighting load. And this, is, this new device was uh, introduced into UL standards and into the NEC uh, for the 2017 cycle because certain load control relays for many years have been used improperly to transfer loads from normal branch circuits to emergency branch circuits. And in fact, an ALCR is not tested or evaluated by UL for that kind of transfer function. So this new BCELTS device offers robust uh, endurance uh, and reliability testing based on the UL 1008 standard uh, for emergency transfer equipment. So you've mentioned, so you mentioned UL 1008, um, and now what, what exactly does that cover? Well, you, you, UL 1008 covers uh, transfer equipment. Now, transfer switches, automatic transfer switches, can range from a manual switch that you manually actuate mm -hmm. by, a, by a switch handle, or an automatic transfer switch that, uh, in, upon loss of utility power, automatically transfers an entire system, mm -hmm. generally on the feeder to the system, okay. from utility power to emergency power, or in the case of this 
uh, new device BCELTS uh, transfers only uh, the load, a small load, up to 20 amps. And in the, in the case of the BCELTS, only an emergency lighting load okay. uh, from normal circuit to emergency. Uh, a general purpose transfer switch covered by UL 1008 will often transfer everything in the building or a large portion of the load in the building. BCELTS is specific to emergency lighting loads. Which makes the control bypass options make a lot more sense. You clearly can't have a whole a whole series of automatic transfer switches would get quite expensive, I would imagine. And yes, although you know this is an important departure uh, for BCELTS in at, uh, in 2017 and beyond, because all of a sudden this device presents a much more economical method to transfer a lighting load from normal to emergency in a very reliable way uh, without uh, building excessive cost into the transfer switch. In the, in the past, we've used uh, feeder level technology for transfer switches on 20 amp branch circuits. That is the same technology that was used on a three phase 400 amp transfer switch ended up being used in a scaled down 20 amp circuit. Uh, this resulted in uh, overly complex and overly expensive transfer mechanisms. So the BCELTS is going to go a long way to making a really robust code compliant transfer mechanism that is very uh, cost efficient. Okay. So we've talked about UL 1008 in regards to transfer switches. What is the UL listing that would cover the ALCR? Well, the ALCR or the automatic load control relay and almost all other emergency lighting equipment is covered under the UL 924 standard, which is entitled emergency lighting and power equipment. And that covers an unbelievable array of equipment actually, exit signs, including photoluminescent uh, exit signs, unit equipment, which is the uh, traditional battery pack, dual headlight kind of uh, uh, emergency lighting equipment. Uh, a new category of emergency lighting equipment, again, introduced in the 2017 code, uh, directly controlled luminaires. That is, lighting fixtures that have a control input that is responsible for getting them turned on uh, in the event of uh, a loss of normal power. Uh, and all kinds of auxiliary equipment involved in the emergency lighting system. So the UL 924 standard is kind of a, if you will, a grab bag of everything related to emergency lighting except transfer equipment, which falls into the UL 1008 right. standard. So anything where I'm talking about a panic look or where I'm, I'm somehow going around the normal control system, like you were saying before, so right. we're talking control bypass that Absolutely. all comes under the UL 924 That's list. right, yes. So uh, a relay cabinet that has a, a um, we call it a complementary listing uh, as emergency power, uh, lighting and power equipment. That is a relay panel that has been evaluated for emergency use. It bypasses normal control, turns the lights on. A, uh, a dimmer rack that is normally dimming the lights and then takes those circuits that are designated emergency and bypasses them in, lo in the event of no loss of normal power. That's listed under UL 924. Um, and again, directly controlled luminaires. That could be any kind of uh, LED fixture, for instance, with a 0 to 10 volt or dolly or DMX 512 control input. Mm -hmm. If that control input is responsible for bypassing the normal control of the unit uh, in term, in, in, when an emergency occurs, then it will be need to be listed. Need to be listed under code uh, under 
UL 924. And that's the fixture itself? You are correct, the fixture okay. itself, yeah. So we have the NEC section or Article 700, we have UL 1008, we have UL 924. Are there any other major code sections or articles that affect how we would put together an emergency lighting? Well, obviously, chapters one through four of the code, which are the basic installation requirements for electrical systems, apply to all electrical systems, not just normal systems or emergency systems. So Article 700 adds the specific requirements for uh, emergency systems, and the UL 1008 and 924 standards dictate how each individual type of equipment is going to be constructed and tested uh, and certified for use in emergency systems. So I've seen on some equipment labels um, marked for legally required standby systems as opposed to emergency lighting systems. Can you talk a little, what's the difference between those two things? Okay, so Article 700 specifically calls out emergency lighting systems. And the definition of that emergency lighting system is the system responsible for the safety of human life. And it has the most stringent requirements in terms of how fast it has to turn on in the event of an emergency. Mm -hmm. The next type of system down the chain in terms of performance or requirements uh, is covered by Article 701, and that is a legally required standby system. And that is has a slightly longer uh, period of time to get turned on in an emergency, and it's there to uh, assist firefighters, people, uh, people rescuing out of the, uh, other people out of the building, mm -hmm. or uh, you know, the, basically local authorities having jurisdiction. It's, it's additional lighting to help them get their jobs done. Then at the bottom of the chain is optional standby systems covered by Article 702. And that is a standby system required or not required, but provided to keep the, the food in the freezer from spoiling, or keep a process going in a factory that needs to be shut down or it will be damaged. Uh, okay. And that has a, the, the least stringent requirement in terms of how fast it needs to get, to get turned on. And this is most evident in different requirements for transfer switches for emergency uh, and optional standby. Functionally, equipment for emergency and legally required standby are the same. So a transfer switch that's listed for emergency also covers legally required standby systems. Sure. However, for an optional standby system, uh, the uh, transfer switch will have different requirements, less stringent requirements in terms of endurance, in terms of fault current withstand, and in terms of uh, its switching mechanism. So it, it, is, it is the least stringent of the equipment types used in these, in these three types of systems. However, what this means is that the consumer or specifier of these, these devices needs to be informed about the type of listing that they have. So, an emer so a transfer switch is not necessarily an emergency transfer switch. Okay. It could be an optional standby transfer switch. And that is something that uh, you cannot use uh, a device rated only for optional standby systems in an emergency application. So how would I tell which is which to make sure I'm not using the wrong one? Well. If they're listed by UL, mm -hmm. the UL certification directory, which is available online, will uh, have each product assigned a category code number or category code, otherwise known as the CCN. It's a four character code. So for instance, emergency transfer switches rated for optional standby use are listed under category code WPXT. 
mm -hmm. in the certification directory. However, switch is rated for emergency or for um, legally required standby are assigned category code uh, WPWR. And that's readily available in, uh, to any, any, on any data sheet uh, provided by a manufacturer or in the UL certifications directory. And that's something that an informed specifier, an informed consumer, needs to really pay attention to. Okay. Because those are both UL 1008 Absolutely. products, yeah. just, but they're not equal. That's, That's right. right. And okay. that, is, that is an important fact here. A transfer switch is not a transfer switch. There right. are two types. Those rated for emergency, CCN, WPWR, right. and those not rated for emergency, CCN, WPXT. Right. Going back a little bit to something we spoke about earlier, you mentioned a couple of new things in the 2017 edition of the NEC. Uh, in relation to emergency lighting systems, are there any other changes that have been made or additions that have been made that you think it's important that specifiers or consumers would want to know about? Well, I mean, I think the big news for 2017 uh, is, uh, number one, we talked about the BCELTS, Branch Circuit Emergency Lighting Transfer Switch. Number two, the Directly Controlled Luminaire which has been called out in previous editions of the code, but was never adequately defined until yeah. the 2017 code. So the result was that inspectors and specifiers said, oh, I see the code calls out a directly controlled luminaire. What is that? Oh, well, there's no definition here, so I can't figure it out. So there was a lot of confusion, which is now going to be swept out of the way. And so the directly controlled luminaire and the requirement for them to be listed under UL 924 for emergency is going to be coming to the forefront after 2000 or in the 2017 code. So that basically means if you're going to have a, a lighting fixture with a control input and it's going to be part of your emergency lighting system, whether or not it operates in your normal lighting system as well, if you're going to use it for emergency lighting, it's got to have a listing for use in emergency uh, power and lighting systems, category code, another category code, right. FTBR. Okay. So we have power panels, we have either load control relays or a seemingly endless list of possible power controlling devices and now we're adding in data controlled fixtures yeah. into our system design it, it seems to me like we ha are just adding a great deal more complexity year after year after year in our emergency lighting systems is there ned i gotta tell you albert einstein could not figure it out <laughs> as we've adopted new technologies, primarily LED lighting technologies, and as we've integrated emergency lighting control further into other systems, we now have an almost bewildering choice of equipment to do the job, <coughs> excuse me, of getting the emergency lighting on. And herein lies the conundrum for the specifier and the engineer. Uh, what is the right combination of devices to, in the most simple and reliable and straightforward way, provide a method to ensure that emergency lighting uh, fixtures get turned on when an emergency happens? I mean, if you just look at uh, our own array of emergency lighting products mm -hmm. and try to determine, well, how are we going to put those together in the simplest, most reliable, and indeed cost-effective, because we can't ignore cost, right? Sure. Cost-effective method. It's pretty bewildering. It really is. And we're work that's why we're working so hard right now to give specifiers the tools to kind of pick through the minefield of choices about which piece of equipment is applicable to their particular type of system. Mm -hmm. Are there any particular tools that 
you're thinking of when you when you say that? What are, what are some of the things that you know that well, I know, we're working towards? And obviously we're working on a design guide for emergency lighting systems, which will effectively be a, fl a decision flow chart, which will ask the specifier various questions about their application and basically uh, lead them through a series of decisions that will help them come out at the end with the types of equipment that we provide that should be used in the system and how they should be interconnected. So, maybe to wrap things up a little bit, you know, we've we've covered a lot of ground, and it's it's a, you know, it's a pretty heavy, and dense subject. Uh, By the way, yeah, it, it's a very tough subject to discuss without a pencil or and paper or a whiteboard. <laughs> sure. Right, because a lot of the complexity of these devices used to control emergency lighting is only revealed in how they're interconnected. And, they're, and the pitfalls of how to, in designing an emergency system are, are there only in uh, overly complex uh, interconnections or uh, interconnections that might not work under certain conditions. So the important fact to understand here is that picking through a series of individual data sheets and looking for the type of emergency listing that these devices have is not going to lead the specifier to what they need. These systems have to be considered on a system level. They have you, the, the entire system has to be looked at for all the conditions that might drive it into an emergency situation or cause it to fail and uh, not operate properly. So a system level analysis is what we're going to try to lead specifiers and consumers of these products to in this design guide that we're working on. Excellent. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank I appreciate you, it. And I'm sure we'll talk again soon. Okay.